Okay. Hi, I'm good. So, you're okay? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. Do um, you want yours up there? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, it's uh, with great pleasure that I uh, am introducing Harold Hess. <clears throat> Harold Hess, uh, I've known, I can't even say since he was this high, we always called him when I first met you. But um, he, I first met him when he was uh, interviewing for Bell Laboratories, and of course Bell Laboratories hired him. Uh, but his full history is he has an A.B. from Physics at the University of Chicago, a Ph.D. Why are you going to do this? Okay. I can't stand this. <laughs> uh, he has a uh, Ph.D. from Princeton. Uh, then he went to MIT as a postdoc where he worked on uh, a very ambitious experiment to uh, see if you can take spinelite hydrogen and uh, cool it down to a low enough temperature where you get both condensation. Uh, it was hard work, and during that work, uh, Harold invented the idea of evaporative cooling and put it in a proposal, a theory of a paper, a proposal where he was the sole author. And so, even though he was working with uh, Great Tech and Kuttner, uh, this was considered such an, a novel and brilliant idea, they said, and it was his, you write it up, your soul up. Uh, he later uh, <coughs> demonstrated the variable cooling uh, of spinelline hydrogen uh, and rather close condensation. But unfortunately, uh, the laser cooling and trapping guy got there first. Uh, but they, a crucial element was um, the property of cool. It was the final cooling stage. Uh, they did get there eventually, they being the spent a lot of hydrogen people, uh, to get both condensation. Um, now, since then, he, uh, as a member of um, the labs, he actually didn't do spinelite hydrogen. He went to something totally different. He used standing plumbing microscopy to study <coughs> superconductors and have a cross vortex lattices. Okay. Then he uh, met, at that time, uh, he met Eric Betzig uh, very, very early on. They became fast friends. <coughs> and the way Eric describes it, um, they would come into, both of them would come in Bell Lab very early, around 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> That's the time you're supposed to leave, not to <laughs> and, and they they say, and they would see if each of those cars were in, who got there earlier, and how much earlier, but they put their hand on the hood to see how much earlier they were. <laughs> anyway, um, with Eric, um, uh, they, they actually work and stimulate each other. Then afterwards, um, Bell Laboratories was not the same. It was changing, falling apart, whatever you say. Uh, both uh, Eric and, uh, and Harold left uh, with different ways of leaving. Harold was a gentle, uh, soft-spoken sort of person. Uh, Eric is different. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, but they still remain very, very close friends. Uh, uh, and um, Eric uh, essentially eventually became unemployed. Uh, Harold bounced around to various companies, um, uh, but also became unemployed. Uh, and so, you know, this is this is uh, your standard way of doing history and science. <laughs> and. Uh, so, but they, they bummed around, they went camping together, they did all sorts of things together, and, uh, but they got together and uh, conceived of something, as soon as it shows, I'll show it. Um, and does this, is my party? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, okay. Yes, not. It doesn't matter, it doesn't, okay. doesn't matter. I was going to show you what they did. So, 
So they were both unemployed at the time. They had this idea of a new way of doing what is now called super resolution microscopy, uh, or Palm. Uh, they co-invented Palm, which Eric Betzig later shared the Nobel Prize for for the super resolution technique uh, with W. E. Murner and also with Stefan Held using different contributions. And uh, they set up the apparatus in the living room of Harold Hess. And the picture I was going to show you was the living room uh, where the stuff was set up. <laughs> and uh, so, and the rest was history. Uh, they uh, were then hired by uh, the Bell Labs of Biology, Janelia Farms, uh, where Harold is now a group leader. And, and it's so in addition to the super resolution stuff, uh, which was widely recognized and Harold just, I guess it was this year, you got elected to the National Academy. Was it this year, last year, this year? Uh, this morning. This morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I didn't know I'm officially this morning. But, uh, we knew it happened long ago. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, uh, so that was, that was great. And, um, and, but he's done not only Palm, but many, many things in my prosperity. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but you're going to hear the latest of what he's done in my prosperity. Uh, so, again, it's been a long history from both condensations, uh, <coughs> or toward both condensations, penalized hydrogen and the prevention of our cooling to STM work uh, of type 2 superconductors to uh, palm super resolution and now a combination of what my craft and everything. So he continues to forge ahead. And I just want to close by saying, I think Eric described his interactions with Harold as, he's the smartest physicist I've ever met at work with, or I've ever met. I think it's maybe I've ever met. <laughs> I'm looking at Bob and wondering, did he meet you? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> okay, with that, I, 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 <laughs> I think this one's on. Okay, can is this working or do I need this one here? Okay, yeah, I'll have both on. Okay, gosh, you've set a very kind and very high bar for the introduction here, and I'll see if I can uh, live up to two percent of that. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's fun being here at Stanford. It's been a while since I've been here, about 10 years ago, I think, last time. And uh, so what I thought I'd do is just introduce the work that I've been doing at Genelia, uh, give a little historical overview, maybe starting where, where, where Steve left off, and uh, a few of these biologically driven image modalities where basically all I just sort of bring is a little physicist, tool builder's expertise and try to make it work for, for, for my friends at Genelia. Um, so this is 12 years ago. Um, some of you might not know of Genelia Farm. That's what it looked like 12 years ago. It's a, a research lab funded by Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Basically, it's an endowment from Howard Hughes. <clears throat> a lot of oil money there. And uh, uh, it's a brand new institution, and they were interviewing in this little building off here on the, you know, on the side with the green circle there. And uh, <clears throat> it was very intimidating at the time. It, was, uh, it has a, a lot of history, a lot of inventions within that uh, institute, patent licenses, patents. Uh, the Howard Hughes investigators, many of them had, were Nobel laureates. They were members of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and so it was like, this is a, a very ambitious place to, to join. And uh, at the time, they had a very simple mission, which was to map neural circuits. I didn't know anything about neurons uh, or complex behavior, uh, but they did, were interested in trying to create new methods of imaging and not, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, computational tools. So I thought, well, maybe I can contribute to that. So this is my opening presentation to my jobs pitch um, about 12 years ago. Um, and I wanted to advertise that, yes, I've been doing micro microscopes back at Bell Labs, and I had a little experience with microscopes in industry, but this should strike you as a little suspicious. 
Um, I was in my own little company called New Quest Research. It's basically a shell company to hide the fact that I was unemployed. <laughs> the reason why I was unemployed, I didn't listen to the customer. Um, and so I tried to learn from that. Uh, I was sharing that experience with a colleague, and that's Eric Betzik. And he likewise was busy working for his own single person company called New Millennia Research. <laughs> so we we're hopeful at the time, and we had just invented this little palm microscope. It had a little higher resolution, and we thought, well, maybe with that, that might be a little bit of our ticket to, uh, you know, to employment again. And so our situation was a, a little bit like this. You know, I'll call this research paradigm number one. Uh, you read the bottom, you know, we, this could be the discovery of the century, depending, of course, on how deep it goes. Um, so that could have been part of the project. You know, essentially, one could just sort of keep digging. Uh, but it's nice to do something extra on research so you can get a little bit more creative on it. So I decided that it's also useful to try to go off in some, some new directions. Uh, you know, how can one do some really high throughput 3D imaging? which was a little bit the background that I was coming from, uh, from, uh, from industry. And also, I learned that, listen to the customer, and the customer here at uh, Genealogy was very interested in neural circuits of fly brains. So everything was fly brains to me at the time. Uh, so the perspective which I came from, I was working with KLA 10 core, and they basically developed very high throughput uh, instruments for imaging computer chips, gigahertz rates, trying to get nanometer resolutions, areas. If you can imagine chopping up a fly brain into thin slabs, spreading it out, is very comparable to what you might expect on a computer chip in terms of complexity, resolution, and things like that that you would need. So I felt like, well, maybe there's an interesting match here to be made. Uh, they have similar number of synapses and, and sort of like that. So yeah, here's my attempt of proposing a project. I was going to get my liquid ethane squirt gun and freeze a fly very quickly and put it under a microtome or other etching techniques and then have some microscopes on there to look at it, maybe electron microscopes. And I presented that. And then to really impress, I was going to do 52,000 fly, fly brains per year, you know, given the maximum power of laser that I could shine through at these things. And uh, hoping to impress. And, uh, and, and they bought it. They hired me. <laughs> so now I was in this dilemma. There's a lot of commitment, resources behind me, and they all were hoping to see where this would lead. Uh, to me, this is actually true research. Uh, my former boss at Bell Labs, Horst Dermer, when he was promoted to a, a larger directorship at Bell Labs, this cartoon appeared on his door. So I think this is... Uh, Real research takes in an environment where you really don't know where you're going. So let's try to figure out exactly what that might mean to image a fly brain. Uh, there have been techniques out there where you simply chop a fly brain up or a piece of neural tissue up uh, into thin grids. Then you can illuminate it with a TEM, collect all the images, stack them up, and then uh, segment, colorize them in and you can reconstruct. This has been done for C. elegans, Manly, about, uh, about you know, good 30 years ago. And there are new techniques uh, where you can also cut with a diamond knife and look at a block face and similarly try to reconstruct circuitry uh, that way, which was just, just on the horizon. So to, to look at the challenge a little bit more directly, uh, the fly brain has about 40 million cubic microns. And in order to see the neural circuitry on there, you want to go in there and sample the membranes and see them crisply and clearly, which means you need to go in there with voxels of around 8, maybe up to 10 nanometers in size. So you can just simply run the numbers. It means a lot of samples, you know, 80 tera, tera voxels of samples. And if you sample with a megahertz, you can just sort of run the numbers and say, well, that's a, a few years of data acquisition. Now, the scary thing is it has to be perfect. So if you're sampling and let's say a half a year or a year into this whole acquisition, 
you know, something happens and there's a gap in the data, you can't trace the wires from one side to the other and the data becomes worthless. So there's an extreme demand on perfection. And uh, yeah, this is just another represent, uh, representation of the whole thing. Sample, I should say, these flies, what they really are, the way the sample preparation works, you take the fly, fix it, infiltrate it with uh, a metal stain, osmium, and then you can further infiltrate, you know, replace the water with epoxy, and it simply becomes a little piece of plastic, uh, which then gets, uh, gets imaged. And <clears throat> in the meantime, two other modalities of imaging sort of appeared. One was collect the slices on tape and image them uh, with backscattering using an SEM. And we decided to focus on uh, the fourth approach down in the lower right corner uh, called FibSim. So instead of using a diamond knife to cut, we use a gallium beam to cut. And the reason is this context. In that whole field, you can try to measure what's the effort to get to the final product uh, of doing some biology. You can prepare the sample, that takes some time, and there are independent experts for that. Imaging, we already said, is going to be on the order of a year, maybe more. But the real barrier was reconstruction, trying to identify and trace each one of these neurons to the level of perfection that you can really go from one side to the other was really daunting and it's really the numbers are on the order of millennia man years of effort. So the thought was well let's maybe we invest a little bit more in the imaging do that a bit uh, more carefully with better fidelity and that should help our friends try and do the computer reconstruction and maybe even enable some some full automation of it and have less manual uh, component to it. So that was that. Uh, FibSim, really, this is just a quick little overview of what it is. You scan with an EM, use the backscatter electrons for detection, then you blast away some sample, maybe about eight nanometers with a gallium beam, and you just repeat this. And it's literally about every minute you go through another eight nanometer layer, and you keep doing this, you know, for a long time. And what you get, with this technique, which uh, differentiates from the other technique, is you get isotropic voxels. It's eight nanometer steps on each uh, Z increment, uh, whereas if you, have, if you use a diamond knife for cutting, the, the thickness might be on the order of 30 nanometers, uh, maybe down to 20 on the block face techniques. Uh, but for the very fine processes uh, that are involved, let's say in the fly, uh, it can, it, that can lead to ambiguities. So we opted for the uh, uh, this FibSim technique. So we got one of these machines and uh, spent a little over a million dollars on it and turned it on and it ran for three days and broke and stopped. And that's typical for these machines. So we have a problem. Um, it's not reliable for more than a few days. So the world darkened. <laughs> so I uh, had to think of a solution. And we got creative. We tried to make it reliable for a few years. It wasn't obvious, but you know, we came to this after a lot of thinking. <laughs> and what it really boils down to, uh, there, there's nothing deep, but we just really took reliability engineering on it very seriously. We controlled temperature fluctuations in the room. If there was any interrupt with uh, the various utilities, gas, water, cooled water, uh, turbo pump exploding, when you have to rebuild, you know, develop a technique where you can sort of gracefully disengage before a problem happens and gracefully re-engage after you rebuild the microscope. Uh, trying to work out all of those possibilities and we sort of went through some very extreme cases of things going wrong. Uh, we got to a point where we think now we have years of virtual reliability on this, uh, this machine. And like there's just one of the components that goes into it. You just take the, this is a, a close up, the yellow line shows the fib beam going across from uh, right to left, strafes the sample and we have little Faraday cups that detect the beam and we can see how much is cutting into the sample or over the top, and this can feed back against temperature fluctuations or other eventualities. Try to use multiple layers. A lot of little things like that. Nothing totally out of the question. 
Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we're really working up all the way to the uh, best physical limits that are determined by, basically, for an electron going in and scattering out. You know, the basic limit here on a single electron beam system is that you can only put so many nanoamps into so many electrons are available per unit time. And you want to get the optimal signal out for each one of that. And the answer is it's within a factor of two. Uh, and you can get that simply by moving the sample at about three millimeter working distance. And you calculate cross sections. You know, just use basic physics to make sure we're really optimized. Um, and then we run into another problem. This focused ion beam, if you're going in, trying to cut off small uh, distances on the sample, can't mill for more than about 50 microns. So if you have a sample and you're imaging this electron area there, you form a little crust of burnt stuff. And as you image, it's uh, a bit like wind going over a pond. As you go downstream, there's a natural instability because of differential milling versus depth. And you end up getting streaks and waves. And the quality of the data suffers the further downstream you are on that. So we needed a solution for that. And uh, another person thought long and hard, came up with the original idea. Don't mill more than 50 microns. <laughs> Cut it into slabs like this. So here's the fly, and he cuts it into slabs, about 30 sections, about 20 microns thick for each one. And then you can laminate that into a little tab. And so your fly turns into uh, a bunch of tabs like that. You can distribute it into uh, different FIPSIMs. And now uh, the big open question is, well, wh how, how good is that cutting surface? You know, can you really stitch across that, or is there some material loss right at that boundary. And uh, remarkably enough, this little hot knife technique uh, is very good. And it's uh, about 98 plus percent traceable from one side to the other as far as trying to get the neural connectivity. Um, so with that, you know, we're encouraged that this might be a good way to go. And in the process, we actually developed uh, an instrument that can sort of ac access a new regime for biological imaging. You can think of uh, imaging in biological space as, let's say, a resolution on the vertical axis. There are a lot of microscope techniques that have way better resolution than FibSim. You know, TEM tomography sort of comes to mind. The other axis is size. Uh, if you want to look at larger and larger samples, it's impractical to do that with, uh, uh, let's say, with tomography because you can't look at sections or too many sections thickness without just becoming a, a very painful effort. And FIBSEM can cover that regime very, very nicely. And with that finally under control, um, we just recently, this year, gotten to the point where we have imaged uh, what we call the hemi brain, uh, after about two years of two fib sims working. Uh, this is a cross section of the fly brain. There are lots of uh, little modules in there, uh, central complex that the fly uses for navigation, which way's north or which way's the food. Uh, you know, so it stores its representation of the world in that, mushroom body for olfactory sensing and the like. And so that data, I'll just show you a little bit what it looks like. Here's a, whoop, let me just sort of get back on here. I have to start this. This ends up a, a collaboration of, uh, of, of many people. Uh, initially, we get the sample from one person who's very dedicated. Then we fib sem, as I explained earlier. And here's the data itself. You see that circular thing in the middle? That's the ellipsoid body uh, used in navigation. You saw the slabs there. And, you know, the fly really has a lot of stuff between its eyeballs. It's, uh, you can see tiny little dots are probably microtubules, or mitochondria there. You might see dark areas in between. Those are synapses. You know, there's a lot, you know, here, for example, is one synapse. You know, they have fan-in synapse and fan-out structures. It's very different than mammalian synapse, where it's just one-on-one. -on -one. 
And from that data, you try to identify the synapses by some machine learning algorithm, find the post and the pre uh, component, and then we work with our partners at Google, uh, who basically take the data set, and they don't have a cluster. You know, they work with data centers when they process this. So we just can't have, you know, potentially have any better partners than them to really run through and just go through this massive amount uh, of data and basically trace with that flood filling algorithm each one of these uh, neurons. And here they're just sort of browsing uh, different parts of it. And many of these neurons, after that step, they just pull out. You know, with uh, in a pretty recognizable form, cell bodies hanging down there toward the side. But not, not all are that, that way. And so some of them are merged or joined together, and some are fragmented where they may be unjoined or unattached. And so a lot of proofreading and curation is still needed, and we have a team of about 30 people who will be invested in this for about the next year, basically running through the data and trying to get to a, you know, a higher level of perfection on there, good enough so that the biologists begin to understand which nerve touches which nerve, what the whole, the beginnings of what the connectivity is on one of these circuits. So, um, yeah, so that's so far, that's just the half of brain. Um, and we still would like to, uh, yeah, so this is just a, point out that these new techniques, the neural net, UNET techniques, uh, really are enabling this reconstruction to get faster. And even with better sample preparation, which is happening at the same time, we get even better contrast. We are now in the point soon where we're now soon again, image limited rather than, uh, you know, reconstruction uh, process limited. So the next ambition is to not just do this partial fly brain, but trying to get the full fly brain. And the fly brain includes not only the head part, but it has something going down the back, the VNC, uh, which also stores a lot of computational power. So before we just had two of these machines. Uh, we've gotten a, a couple more. And so that takes the total time of imaging down to two and a half years. That's still a little bit much, so we got a few more. <laughs> And so in a, a few months, this should be our situation and we'll start trying to go after that one fly and hope we don't make any bad mistake for, hold our breath for about uh, a little over uh, a year to get there. So with that kind of capability, <clears throat> uh, we we'll try to ask, well, are there other ways to, to use these FibSEMs? So far we pretty been much focused on just one particular application, which is this fly brain, which means, you know, we're happy with a resolution of eight nanometer, but we just want to get this volume in a reasonable uh, time scale, you know, reasonable fraction of a scientific career. Um, and, and these are typical parameters. We're doing about, you know, 10 to the six cubic microns per month per, uh, per tab uh, or per, per, per machine, eight nanometer voxels. Uh, we can take a typical SEM, you can reduce the aperture, reduce the current on that. And typically that means better resolution. But it knocks down the throughput in, uh, in a very big way. So we could operate down there. So we're definitely out of the mode of trying to image a full fly at this time. But maybe this might be of interest if you want to do full cell sized imaging. So in this grand phase diagram of uh, biological possibilities, cell volumes of, uh, you know, maybe up to 100 uh, by 100 by 100 microns uh, are a possibility with somewhat better resolution. And what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> we, we dose the sample a little bit more. We have some more enhanced waves. Our throughput's way reduced uh, by probably over an order magnitude, but still can do usable things. Contrast difference is the sort of gives a typical example between our high throughput, just get the whole fly done, versus let's look at a little bit more detail. This is still not at the level of what you might expect for high resolution TEM, but uh, it does give us uh, volumes. 
And here it just sort of shows some details. At the bottom, those are synapses which are being picked out. Uh, at this level, you can actually see the microtubules. You can see the core of it. That's a, a little bit of a resolution standard uh, that we can pull out. Ribosomes show up nicely. Here's a, another example. Mammalian tissue is a lot easier. Things are, are bigger, processes are bigger. Uh, and what's nice about this particular approach, you can slice the data because it's isotropic. You can view it in any different angle as you want, which is often not easy in electron microscopes if you're constrained by a section or planar imaging unit. So you can explore in a way uh, that's much more flexible. Here, for example, on the left, you can see Golgi forms an arc, and there's this fiber stuff that goes around it that connects to some uh, microtubule organizing complexes that you would just not see otherwise if you just sort of randomly uh, see the data in a plane. The data can be segmented. Here you can sort of map out the endoplasmic reticulum, see how well it contacts plasma membranes or mitochondria. You can try to do this on a, a whole cell basis and get larger statistics on it than you would if you just have a, again, just a representative sample. This is a simple sample of a Chlamydomonas, um, the cross section there, you can see the nucleus. And the data is very dense. Uh, so just by doing a simple operation, like taking the outer shell of the nucleus, notice there are a few little white spots decorating the outer part of the nucleus. If you just sort of cut that shell out, a uh, little 30 nanometer thick shell around the outer part of the nucleus and visualize it and you see polyribosomes just like that. You know, no further processing. So these are the little chains, little RNA there, ribosomes line up on it and sort of busy manufacturing the proteins. If you look between them, you might, actually is there a pointer up here or, uh, well, sort of up in that corner figure, you can see the, uh, uh, you know, the nuclear pores in between, you know, get a little, why are the ribosomes showing up as bright? They are, they stain more heavily, uh, a little bit more heavily than the nuclear envelope, and they also protrude up from the nuclear envelope. And so if you cut a shell which skims the nuclear envelope and everything else just to the outside of it, you then are imaging what's just a few nanometers above the nuclear envelope surface. And that's literally what it looks like. You're, we're, we're just masking off a shell. I mean, this is not a biology talk, but I'm, I'm Yeah, I'm uh, thank nurses. goodness. So, so this, is a, this is a eukaryotic cell, mm -hmm. and the ribosomes are, they're doing stuff on the surface. Of the nucleus, yes. Normally, uh, if, if you look also on top of the endoplasmic reticulum, that's usually where you expect ribosomes yeah. to sit on top of the ER. The, the ER is actually a, essentially sort of the extension of the nuclear envelope. It sometimes reaches down and touches it. We see a lot of ribosomes uh, touching the surface of the ER. Uh, one can do exactly the same kind of experiment, segment out, or you know, I shouldn't say experiment, but really just a little analysis, segment out the uh, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum membrane and see what bright spots are just, you know, let's say 10, 20 nanometers just to the outside of it. So, you know, so you can do, again, I'm not sure where one can go with this on the biological side, but certainly now you can just count ribosomes. Let's see how many are on the surface of the nucleus. How long are these chains? I don't know. Some of them are paired up. I don't know if they're forming dimers or what, but uh, it's, you know, to my depth of biology, it's, I think it's pretty. Um, so what else can we do? One more thing. Sure. The, connecting the chains is allegedly a messenger? Yeah, RNA. yeah, it's a little RNA sort of there and it's busily, you know, the ribosomes sit and supposedly the RNA moves and as it moves it's, you know, building up a little protein and that which pops off. That's the cartoon. So where can go uh, can go with this. Um, we decide, well, it might be fun just to make some standard reference cells. You know, can we just get a whole HeLa cell, uh, sample it, maybe at this uh, resolution. It might take about a month of imaging, but might be sort of a usual, you know, maybe interesting reference for people in, 
in the field. So we're just beginning to play games like that. This is probably doesn't really do justice to the data because we're way demagnified on it. Uh, but this represents about one month of data. Uh, you can see the, it's, it's a nucleus. Again, there are these little polyribosomes sitting on the surface. They're not quite as clear. Mitochondria can be segmented out. Uh, this is a lot of manual effort to go in there, take the data, segment it out. Uh, I think this is an area which is also ripe for a lot more automation, forming ground truth data sets. And you know, it's, it's a barrier, I think, right now to try to get from black and white hard disk drives to biology. Yes? How does this compare to the resolution of like cryo-EM? It sucks. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's a cryo-EM. You can go down and on those ribosomes really get the full atomic arrangement you know, or get some deeper atomic structure of exactly you know, where the beta chains and alpha chains are and how it gets put together. We, can, we get down to the level where we can see a microtubule, we can see the core. I think we have potential to go further. Presumably these microscopes can get down to, you know, one to two nanometers resolution. Uh, you can do better with TEM, thanks largely because you have higher energy electrons going through and, you know, your spots, you know, you're not limited by the, the focal spot size that uh, limits uh, the, the SEM resolution. Uh, but Again, I think it's very complementary. Uh, this, the advantage here is you can just do whole cells uh, as a simple push button operation. And you can't do that with the TEM because you need to transmit through, you know, maybe 300 nanometers of, uh, of material. This is just a close up of the same cell. You can see this piece of the centrosome in the middle. There's a microtubule sort of extending off to the to the right, the nuclear membrane. Chromatin sort of in the middle. I mean, it's very tempting to sort of begin to imagine each one of those dots as a histone. We can't resolve it with the resolution here, but it's, it's a little tantalizing. Here's the same data just shown as a movie. You know, this is really just a piece of that <clears throat> larger three-dimensional data set that I showed earlier, Golgi up there. There you'll see the central. You can see it's sort of the edge view right there again. So Harold, is this, we're looking at the nuclear membrane here? Yeah, going across, that's the nuclear membrane. You can see the nuclear pores come and go in there. So the nucleus is, help, is it the bottom? The nucleus is the bottom the half, bottom, yes. Bottom uh, below the little curved bowl, that's all chromatin and different levels of DNA and different levels of compaction okay. in there. And uh, just another view of the same, <clears throat> same data set. So, okay, so I like to just switch focus and this is the EM. And of course, we've been doing a little bit of super resolution optical measurements earlier and be fun to see, well, can we begin to match these image modalities? So, the, in the electron microscope, we've been looking at just a simple heavy metal stain. You know, it stains all the membranes. Uh, it sort of osmium preferably stains, uh, you know, fatty things. Uh, it gives a global black and white context. You know, everything's stained to some level of gray. Um, and, you know, but it's not really specific. Whereas fluorescence microscopy is just totally the opposite. You know, you might have a protein of interest and you can just target that, you know, out of the 10,000 or so proteins within a cell, you can just target a, a few of them. Uh, but very often when you do that, you target, let's say, one protein, you're just going to see blobs more or less floating in the darkness and you lose context. So uh, these two techniques really do belong together to give a fuller picture of what's going on uh, in the biology. Just a quick primer for, you know, the non-biologists. Uh, like me, so I know what I'm doing. The uh, fluorescence labeling is just simply a matter of taking a protein, for example, here's a protein associated with a microtubule, and attaching a light bulb to it. Typically, that means uh, GFP or some other fluorescent label. It could be genetically encoded or it could be attached covalently by some other linking techniques. 
And with that, people, you know, in the past 20 years, there's been sort of revolution of fluorescent labeling of cells using these techniques. But the problem is like microscopy. So if you compare it to the diffraction limit, you're very far away from it. And the, the technique that Eric and I worked on was we noted that some of these fluorescent labels can blink. And if you look at a certain subset, watch them blink, try to find their centroid and just add them up, you know, nothing too deep. You know, you have a new microscope, which we call the palm microscope. So can we make some of these techniques work together? You know, here's an early image of our palm stuff from over 10 years old now. So the dilemma that you sort of face when you try to combine the two modalities is they're left with this little choice between good and bad. You can get really good electron microscope images if you have very strong fixatives in there, but usually that might kill the fluorescence, it might kill the antigenicity, or somehow get in the way of the blinking. Or at the other limit, if you want to sort of preserve the fluorescence, uh, the chemical fix might be so weak that the membranes fall apart and don't have contrast. Well, you can make, you know, more robust fluorescent uh, proteins, that's sort of like one direction. Uh, and we decide to take, well, let's, let's go all out. We're physicists, so, you know, don't know anything about chemicals, but I know how to make things cold. So we went with cryofluorescence um, and cryofixation. The nice thing about cryofixation, it also can get around what might be artifacts associated with chemical fixation. And uh, they're actually very nice tools, which people have already invented, uh, which can basically freeze things very, very quickly. Oh, here, let me just give you a couple of examples of good EM versus bad EM. In one case, you can see the substructure of the mitochondria on the left. In the other case, everything's a big mush. That was from our first paper. And here's an example of good or bad high resolution. In one case, we get a nice, complete mapping of more proteins. In the other case, there's a lot of aggregation and not many of the fluorophores light up. There can be compromises in there. So that, that's typically what you're, you're fighting. So, okay, so here we develop, try to develop a technique that can try to combine the best of both worlds. We start out with cells cultured on a, uh, a cover glass, and then we high pressure freeze them. So that's my squirt gun. Uh, I learned out about, about high pressure freezing well after I got hired. So this, this, this machine exists. Uh, it can freeze within milliseconds in a vitreous state uh, under high pressure, which avoids crystal formation, which is the key. And then normally to get sam prepare the sample for FibSem, it goes into a free substitution where the water gets replaced with alcohol and then later with epoxy monomers and osmium gets stained, turns into plastic, goes back to room temperature into FibSem. So can we intercept the sample just before it goes uh, into this freeze substitution machine, you know, while it's just vitrified. And just take a quick optical look. So we built a transfer gizmo for it and a low temperature cryofluorescence microscope to, to intercept. And we added uh, SIM and other capabilities to it. So literally here, now we just, sample is located on a, a little copper block and it's essentially facing out to the world through, a, room, uh, through a, a window to a room temperature objective. It allows all the rest of the optics to be done at room temperature. And the rest is just a, a nice uh, sample transfer scheme uh, where we avoid icing and other standard problems that come in the way. Now, we did this many, many years ago once. And so we put in a sample, cooled it down, and imaged it and it was bright and it glowed. And then we tried to bleach it and it wouldn't bleach. And then we tried to make it blink and it wouldn't blink. And then we gave up on it. Uh, but a positive thing is that they last forever. You know, a lot of the processes which quench them, little single oxygens can go around and destroy some, you know, some bonds in, uh, disappears. So you can get a lot more photons out of these things. And the second time around, we decided to revisit this, uh, but just spend a little bit more time exploring other fluorophores and seeing 
do any one of these have nice properties that could be used for fluorescence and are just not internally bright? And uh, we also set up the system to use uh, structured illumination microscopy, which is a technique where instead of just getting the wi uh, a white field image, you illuminate with a pattern uh, like that represented in, in the B. And if the sample has wavelengths, as in A, you multiply the product of the illumination with the sample, and you get more ray frequencies, you can back calculate to what that means in the original s sample. And you essentially get spatial frequencies, which are about doubled what you might have in a regular microscope. And so that was one of the imaging modalities that we added onto it. And here's sort of like a sample of different focus images going through a sample, different level planes. And you might see the, the rotating structured illumination in that and the reconstructed image on the side. Nice thing, this is fast. We get uh, resolutions not that much better than optical. It's not quite super resolution, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's respectable. And so we added that kind of optics to, to the back end of it. Uh, there it is. And there's some data uh, associated with it. So here we have uh, labels. We're labeling mitochondria with one color. Uh, this was, yeah, this was M cherry and M, M emerald, uh, which works uh, very well. They sort of form two complementary uh, color sets that work well at low temperature. This is SIM. And I'll just show you a few pretty pictures. Mitos M emerald, ER with cherry this time, nucleus with papaya. The, these fruits are, uh, you know, I don't know where the names come from, but Roger Chen loved to sort of na uh, label Rogers, them by color. Roger's proteins? Or a lot products? of them, yeah. yeah. Th these, are, these are proteins here. We've also done some dyes too. Uh, but these are proteins here. And you can sort of zoom in on them. And of course, this thing is also in 3D. Uh, it's a nice thing again with about SIM. Actually, a further nice thing about CryoSIM is that you're benefiting from the fact that these floors, again, they don't bleach or quench. But room temperature SIM, you really suffer if you want to image thick cells for a little bit longer time while you're imaging the lower layers, you probably bleach the upper layers. And so there's a bit of compromise. So this is. Uh, just simply cooling things down, you know, if nothing else is, is, uh, is beneficial for SIM. Here's another example, is a montage. We're traveling to a distant cell. <laughs> Final frontier. There it is in different colors. SIM, we're imaging a 10 Kelvin. We decide to go down a little bit lower Kelvin uh, temperature just to see if there are different properties. Uh, from 10 even to 77, and some, some fluorescent proteins do show uh, different characteristics. Now, another thing that we noticed, if we put a sample in there, uh, certain ones, and I think this is, I think that might be emerald here. Uh, it, uh, as you burn it down, you actually get to a point where it blinks, and you begin to see individual molecules at a time, and you can reactivate, refresh these things by hitting it with 405. So this is much like, uh, oh, this is Janelia dye, which does that. Emerald does it too. Uh, so this is much like, uh, you know, in, in the spirit of, of Palm. We now have a possibility of doing this uh, localization microscopy on it. Uh, or maybe it also could be used for nonlinear SIM too. So there's Palm again, and this is some data showing how these cells might blink and how you can reconstruct. Downside, it's slower, resolution's a little bit better, you know, and we're still sort of working. I'll just give you a few examples of what cells can look like. Uh, here's just looking at the endoplasmic reticulum out in the periphery. Oops, oh, did that skip a lot of slides there? Okay, yeah, so that's just sort of one color. Oh, and then we try to get vertical depths on it by using the upper, the technique in the upper right. We basically form an asymmetric beam, uh, optical beam, and we measure the ellipticity to get the, the vertical position. That's sort of a standard technique. Um, and so we can get the, you know, that's how we get the depth out of it. And these are some more images. 
pretty pictures. Let's see. Yes. These are cells of what? These are, oh, I'm not sure. Is this a heal? I think we've been largely working with cos cells and HeLa cells. Uh, we have a few different varieties. Uh, some are uh, U2OS cells too. And, uh, and this is the surface of the thing or is it flattened out? It's flattened out. They're not quite natural environment. So it's on a cover glass. They sort of spread out a little bit like an egg uh, on a pan. So they're a little bit artificial structures. Uh, and there is of course interest to try to get a little bit more of a native environment <clears throat> if possible. This is just zooming in, for example, on mitochondria. Uh, this is a U2OS cell. Uh, zooming in, we can sort of see the outer boundary of it. And this is cos 7 cell. Yeah, there it identifies. And the label here is M. emerald combined. I have to ask a really dumb question. I don't know what cos 7 is. Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> cos, uh, it's probably some. Some, some biologists can help me up there. It's uh, uh, Gila is sort of famous as sort of a Henrietta Lass cell, but, uh, but they're very standard cells. They tend to flatten out. Uh, biologists tend to use them a lot. So now, having done that, we've imaged it optically. Now we're not like to complete the correlation. And so in the upper yellow box, we take the sample out of the cryoimaging system transfer it into this free substitution thing, basically pull, pull all the water out, replace it with alcohols, epoxies, stain it with metal. We x-ray it to try to find our cell that we just imaged, trim it up to that, put it into a FibSim, and get the, uh, this is again showing the sequence. Then we get an x-ray image, locate the cell of choice, trim it up, and it gets put then into a FibSim. And then you can begin to combine the data sets. Top right is FibSim data set of that cell at different magnifications, just looking at one representative plane. It's really a big 3D block, so it gets a little bit hard to really appreciate in full 3D. The, the left two is a sim image of that cell. The other one's a palm image of the same cell. And you can begin to register them. Now, registering is, a, is an interesting problem. <clears throat> to first order, if you just have a, you know, four points, you can then register to 3D objects pretty, uh, pretty well, maybe to about half a micron in accuracy. Now, it turns on by this final step of processing where we're dehydrating it, reinfiltrating it with uh, uh, epoxy, we actually get a tiny bit of swelling. And so the actual cell size and shape is a little bit off. And so to really do good co-registration, you need to register uh, at a higher level. Um, <clears throat> I think in the end for this technique to work, you know, one might have to use some internal fiducials or reference. In this case, just using mitochondria uh, as a reference, you know, they're visibly, you know, they can be visible both in the optical and the EM channel, and one can overlay. Here's another representation of the, you know, same data set. We have lousier resolution in the vertical direction, you know, um, <clears throat> so there's definitely room for improvement. Here's a, a movie showing the, that, that data set, and then, then overlay. There's a the nucleus again. <clears throat> and just playing with the 3D data set. And then I'll overlay with both the, the ER channel, endoplasmic reticulum in yellow, and in blue, the, uh, the mitochondria. And if you look carefully, you can see that they, they, they do seem to match pretty well, but they do have what looks like errors because of the rather poor, you know, not so great resolution in the Z direction. So, you know, with that, we're beginning to work with various people on different experiments, trying to find adhesion proteins, which are working between different nerve cells. Or here, they're uh, transferrin, I guess, which uh, might form in uh, certain extensions within these cells. 
you know, it's a little question where they, where they exist. So you can get the EM image and then you sort of find what might, you know, the little substructure where certain proteins uh, exist or don't exist. This gets into the biology where we sort of pass it off to them. But quickly on numbers, <clears throat> so with the, uh, uh, both the SIM and PALM, they do work nicely at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and the PALM works well for our particular geometry where we have a, a low numerical aperture. Uh, because there's so many more photons, you know, we're, uh, it's, it's okay. And, uh, you know, and we seem to be able to correlate it up to a, a, a level where we can do it without compromising the quality of either the EM image or really losing fluorescence uh, count on, you know, from the fluorescent label or seeing ad adverse effects on the fluorescence channel. Uh, resolution, cryosim is most convenient, but uh, resolution is not that much more than you might have with a regular optical microscope. Palm does a little bit better, um, or cryopalm rather, Z resolution still uh, has something to be demanded. Uh, FIBSEM, uh, it's not as high as uh, TEM, but you know, we're comfortable with getting sub 10 nanometer in all, all directions. Uh, next thing to think about is can we boost the cryopalm resolution up to something a little bit more comparable to, to FIBSEM? And we're thinking about trying to adapt the, something we called IPALM to the cryo environment. I'll remind you, IPALM is a method of doing interferometry uh, where we just have two opposed objectives. And imagine now a cryo sample sitting right in here in between. And if that particular protein is lifted, uh, can make my little mouse cursor go, if that's a little bit higher. Uh, it's not working. Ah, darn. Oh, there it goes. Okay, turned on. Yeah, so if that molecule goes higher or lower, it basically changes the path length from going through the top objective or the bottom objective, and you can interfere those two beams such that it forms an interference that goes out a three-way beam splitter, analyze the intensity in each of the three channels, and you can get a vertical resolution, which is... Uh, you know, much superior even to what we have in the XY direction. So something like the little lentil that you see down here in this lower corner. And so we used this on, on viruses before to, uh, for information. So I think that's, uh, you know, it'll be an interesting channel just to see how far we get on that. So, you know, just to summarize the other, uh, you know, larger quest. I mean, again, in 2006, I came in advertising 52,000 fly brains per year to satisfy the customer. Uh, 2018, we've gotten up to about half a fly brain, and we're excited about getting the full one in the next two years. Uh, difference is, we got this now with eight nanometer resolution, so we have like about, you know, five, six orders of magnitude more. Uh, volumetric resolution than we had uh, in our initial proposal. So, and all of that, of course, is, uh, you know, dependent on just the contribution of so many people around me, and, and particularly in Janelia. I have a small group, uh, you know, Gleb, Sean, who does the FIBSEM, Gleb, who does the, the optics, Ken Hayworth, also associated with the, uh, you know, the FLY project. A few consultants, and largely work with just various members around, uh, Eric, of course, and David Hoffman, sort of uh, responsible for a lot of the cryo-correlative uh, uh, work. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Questions? Have you been in touch with the neuroscientist group? Uh, which? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, here. Okay, no, no. Um, this, uh, that's probably, yeah. This sort of like one step out of my own world from the physics, but yes, I think that'd be that'd be useful. Yes. Yeah. Curious how much one fly brain differs from another. Oui. Yeah. Very. Yeah. This. 
really gets into a lot of very interesting questions. Um, we will be able to begin to answer that maybe by subunit, by subunit comparison. Uh, earlier we did an ex uh, preliminary versions of this uh, imaging. We looked at the optic lobe and it has sort of a repeating pattern uh, of omnitidia. And you think, okay, well, how identical are there? So we imaged about seven of them. And we found out one little general rule, or you know, just when you sort of plot it. There's some neurons, which are a particular type of neuron, you know, call it M MI10 or whatever, they have various names for it. And it might like have a, a hundred connections to a different kind of neuron. And then there are other neurons which might have a sparse set of connections, maybe 10. Now, if you look among several different components, the variance of that number of connections n scales as a square root of n. So it, it's almost statistical. You know, so if you have 100 connections and you look at neighboring examples of it, you know, it's going to be 100 plus or minus 10. Seems to follow. Now, maybe that'll be a similar case for different fly individuals if everything else was identical. But I think knowing that variance and being well calibrated on that I think is going to be important. It also dictates how completely we analyze and try to trace all the nerves to make sure that we're below some natural variance and have an accurate representation of the, you know, the connectivity. And of course, really, future experiments are going to be dependent more on, you know, what's the fly-to-fly -fly difference? You know, this one has a certain genetic background or certain experience or certain food or uh, compared to this one. And I think that's where the biology is going to be, you know, it's going to be mined more in, in those situations. And having a sense of what is the variance might sort of help inform, you know, what's the threshold for making a memory, if it's synapse size or count or what that goes in there. How to mine this data, I think, is all, you know, still to be determined. And I think it's in a relatively primitive state right now where it's, we're just counting synapses. The, the data is so rich, so many other things to look at in there which may or might not be relevant. If, because it takes so long at the moment to get the mm -hmm. super, even your half resolution, it still takes a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just take some subsection of the fly brain, which the biologists suspect would be much more malleable to experience. Exactly. That, that you could then zoom in on that. And, and so which parts of the brain do the fly experts think would be like that? Depends on which expert you talk to. They have <laughs> very, very strong opinions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of argument. Yeah, like image this first. No, image that first. Um, but there are some. Does that mean you, get, you have you know eight more? <laughs> more, yeah. Well, we're actually, to be honest, we're exploring some alternate techniques that maybe can give us another order of magnitude independent using some multi-beam approach. But. I think once, you know, a reference is established, there are a few typical areas, certainly the optic area, there's a whole community investing, uh, trying to understand the whole optical pathway, how that gets pre-processed, compressed into data. I mean, these, these flies are way more involved and evolved than we are. I mean, they have many more evolutionary generations to really optimize their circuitry. And, uh, and that at the other end, there are people specialized in the olfactory, you know, where's the memory? It, if it has a bad smell, but it, it gets associated with food, you know, they'll relearn what it is. Or they can learn location, you know, the, the safe place is that way compared to the big square on the wall. You know, there's, there's a lot of processing that they, they can do. And and each one of those experiments will then be maybe guided by what people know uh, from a reference cell or people will have done you know little electrophysiology or cell imaging there's a whole orthogonal world of optical labeling and functional imaging of activity going on 
you know, within the fly brain, which says, okay, this cell is lighting up, but one doesn't know what neuron it connects to. One doesn't have the circuit. Uh, and what's further still confounding this, uh, this is very incomplete. You know, even if you do have a synapse, you know, one doesn't even know exactly which neurotransmitter. So you have to get further experiments to map the neurotransmitter and find out, you know, is this an inhibitory or is this an excitatory synapse? So a lot of things still have to be, you know, added to complete the picture. So I think this is, it's, this is not the final Hamiltonian of the universe once you get this. It's, it's just the beginning of a big problem. So Harold, do, do yeah. you have a downstream crew that's computer modeler people and mm -hmm. biological interface people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that, they, that they ask you questions like what we'd like to know? Um, okay. Um, yeah, it, it varies. I mean, uh, all the way downstream, I think they're just happy to get the data at the moment. And, you know, we haven't gotten to the level where they're like next level experiments. Uh, people do come independently and might have thoughts on experiments which can sort of match up with the capabilities and we try to discuss, okay, can this be done as a independent of this project? Does it fit in? I, I, I'm not sure where you're headed right now. Uh, well, it, there's, a, look perplexed. There's, a, there's a function of, a, of an instrument builder, right. which is miraculous. <clears throat> you know, these, these technologies are wonderful. Right. And then there's the interface to uh, biology questions, which I myself as a theorist think is engineering questions. It's nature mm -hmm. engineering itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, exactly. Uh, there's a, always this loose end of mm -hmm. what this amazing instrument can tell you about mm -hmm. the engineering principle of the organism. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and you need a crew, you know, we, we can't do that. We need geneticists to do that, I guess. Or right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So anyway, what you say is I think there's sort of an amorphous blob. It's an amorphous blob at this point. We're hoping it'll self-assemble. I mean, a lot of people are, are aware of this imaging taking place. There's, it's bureaucratically organized right now uh, to at least make the data available and presentable. What form it takes place, that's still a little bit open and it's going to involve discussion from the downstream people. How do they want to see the connectivity? What does one want to mine out of the data set? It's, it's presently evolving and ripe for input at all levels, essentially. Does, does either of you guys know, first of all, how big the fly genome is? And secondly, what, what fraction of it encrypts the adult body? And of that, what fraction encrypts brain stuff? Good questions. I don't know. Uh, but I think that would be... Yeah, and it would be cool to get right down to some fundamentals. I and mean, there are people who try to figure out, okay, what's the basis for this particular neural type doing this crazy branching pattern off at this level? I mean, there's this amazing architecture of this brain as it self-assembles. And a lot of these nerves all have well-defined fields and pull out directionality and and, and so there's something in the growth cone of the nerve, you know, which says, okay, I've reached level four, turn right, march so many steps, stop, synapse, boom. You know, so there's some coding in there. And, but now you need to go in there and like, okay, what, what do you go in there and how do, how do you find those receptors that tell where it is? And, and you know, there, it's, it's a whole community, uh, an amorphous community, as you said they might suggest right now, trying to figure out how to navigate through this. So this will be just another compounding yeah. thing to look at. Look, as an editorial, I would say, if you think about what happened at the beginning where people said, let's map the human genome, and a lot of people said, what the hell good is that? It's just a stunt. What's, you know, who cares? And then many, much later, it turns out, it, all sorts of things happen. There is a big thing that says, let's do the connect them with the brain. What, what they want to do with it is, well, I just have a vague feeling, you know, we just want to know where all the connections go. But now, uh, what Harold is doing and others are, if you have a molecular labeling at, at a nanometer scale, or five nanometer scale, to, to the big connect thing, 
I think it was uh, you've got now not one but many many genomic maps, mm -hmm. and and they're still in hunt and gathering mode in the genome, and, but and they're long going to be in hunt and gathering mode for many decades yeah, for yeah. this stuff because they because you don't know how much info there's they you couldn't dream of what you wanted to do with it have molecular recognition at the nanometer or let's say ten nanometer scale yeah. with <clears throat> ultrastructure resolution at the three nanometer, five nanometer, ten nanometer scale for the whole or, or, organ. You know. Uh, so so they don't know even know how to digest it yet. And so I think this is just the beginning of decades more of it's gonna come out. And and so it's it's you know, it's a big deal because no one has ever had this before. In fact, they really barely dreamed of having this a decade ago. Yeah, yeah, especially in the past year with all the progress happening with the, the neural net. Look, guys, I, I, we're I love, I love <laughs> experimental science and I love new instruments. I'm just thinking, you know, how do you get a piece of the bigger pie for yourself? That's, mm. yeah. <laughs> or for myself. For yourself. Okay, well. <laughs> Sydney Brenner, you know, you know, progress in science comes from new instrumentation, uh, new observations, new thinking, in that order. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes, though, the third thing never happens. Uh, well, eventually, but it, the first thing is new instrumentation. Yeah. And new observations is the second thing. Yeah. From new, and then and then after that, maybe you have some new ideas. Yeah. And maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. And I <laughs> definitely, I remember when going through this initially, we just went through the circuitry in, you know, in part of the optic lobe. You know, and you get a few of these units and you think, oh, now here one has the full connectivity, one should understand it. Uh, no way. <laughs> it's really CLO, it's like uh, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, you know, it's one of the things, the Z resolution, I don't know if you know, but one of my former postdocs, I don't know if you mm. uh, had done the Z resolution by brute force. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and you mm. know, you, so you get super resolution X and Y that gives you, you know, mm. 10 or 15 nanometers, but it really right. was crappy. Mm -hmm. And so you can get, you know, five nanometers in that. But your uh -huh. solution to making it really practical was wonderful, of this multiple interference. But the oh. thing he did mm -hmm. brute force. He did mm -hmm. the, the whole thing interferometrically stable, but man, mm -hmm. just a comment mm -hmm. of three. That's cool. Yeah, that thanks. Is, you know, a little techie nerdy. <laughs> Are there any other? Uh, yes. So for doing larger animal brains, like mouse or human brains, is it just a matter of buying like a thousand of these machines, or is it parallel to sort of um, yeah, believe it or not, we've gone through crazy calculations of how many billions of dollars. But uh, no, I think a little bit more immediately on the horizon, uh, Winfred Dank, who you know has his own approach. You know, he's also a good colleague. Uh, he's set his sights on trying to do the full mouse brain, and we're exploring another modality of trying to mill, not with a FibSim, but with a, a little bit broader area milling so that we can get wider slices and imaging not with a single beam system but using a, a multi-beam system. The semiconductor industry has pioneered a lot of high throughput technologies you know over the past 20 years and most of them are just sort of you know they're too expensive to use. Uh, but some have survived uh, and so there are multi-beam instruments has like about 100 beams principal can go maybe 100 times faster. You always have to check that if there are any caveats. So I think there's room to try to think about scaling this whole thing uh, up to a full mouse brain. I don't think that's out of the question for maybe within the next 10 years or so. But it, it comes with a host of other problems. You know, you have to stain the mouse brain all the way to the interior. Uh, and that's not easy. And computation, I think, you know, that's been amazing. It's coming along pretty quickly. Can we image it with reduced resolution? Probably. You know, mouse brain and mammalian brain cells are just that much bigger and easier to see. Uh, I think, you know, I think we're going to see that. There'll be, people are doing millimeter sized chunks of bird and mouse right now, but the transition to get to the full mouse uh, will get a little, you know, technically there are a few little issues that get in the way, but I think it'll happen. Is it possible to do kind of like online detections? Like, 
serial interested in like axons tracing across a certain region and you want to look at kind of specific areas around them, could you do it online to basically say having to scan the entire sample and basically you know where your starting point is and it has your slice in between the image parts that you know are connected from previous slices or is that not really possible? Yeah, I think the way we're doing it right now, we're sort of committed on the imaging, um, and we just have to go through that, you know, in one shot. You know, we might be able to target certain areas in the future. Um, once the data is collected, and it it goes probably through a you know a week in a data center or something like that, or at nighttime when the you know the workload's down. Uh, you know, then one can have tools to, you know, to try to begin to explore, you know, potentially online with other collaborators and the like, you know, what's connected to what, what attributes, I, I don't know, to me the world's open a little bit, what you might want to, uh, you know, pull out or deem significant, biologically significant to it. But I think it does mean there's, there's going to be just a whole nother layer of Tool building, but for exploring the you know terabyte or whatever of data, you know hundreds of terabytes of data to, to make sense of it in some way. Okay. Oh, yes. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. <laughs> okay. One last. Have you explored different imaging or display modalities such as stereoscopic looking the eyes and different perspectives to get here? Yes. Yes. I, I think <clears throat> we're just. As part of dealing with the data, we have to proofread it. We have to make sure, are there twigs all properly connected? Uh, have we merged a few cells together so it has two cell bodies? And how do we separate that? And so over the past year, we've adopted you know, little virtual reality goggles and some tools to go and zap this and zap that and split it conveniently, which we think is going to have a big impact on being able to uh, at least proofread and make sure the data is all correct. And I'm sure at some level, you know, that's going to be able to inform maybe what you can pull out of it, but that's, uh, that's still all, you know, to me a little bit open, you know, how, how do you want to characterize the details? Do you want to highlight the mitochondria in it? Whatever, I don't know. So before we thank the speaker, <clears throat> I just want to ask one last question. So, Harold, you work at Bell Labs? Yep. And you worked at Geneo Farms, and when they were designing Geneo Farms, they wanted to make it like the closest thing to MRC and Bell Labs that they could. Right, right. Interview a lot of veterans of both of those places. Mm -hmm. uh, and Eric once said that Geneo Farms is Bell Labs on steroids or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you'd still say that, but. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. But, um, and so. Now, with your perspective, and also looking mm -hmm. forward to the future of where you think Geneva Farms is going, Bell Labs mm -hmm. have been Bell Labs for 50, 60, 70 years. Right, right. Uh, give us your perspective on these two organizations. And yeah, I, I think there are a few things which made, I mean, one thing that stands out for me which made Bell Labs, I mean, to me, I think of Bell Labs as a, you know, a place where you can have a super postdoc, essentially, if you have a, a big vision you know, you typically get hired, go there, work whatever, seven years, and then go off and try to expand on that topic or field, you know, if you want a larger group. Bell Labs typically had a, a very small group size. You know, you're lucky if you got one technician and one. really lucky if you got a postdoc on top of that. Yeah, that's as high as you can get. That's as high as you can get, yeah. <laughs> Genelia is a little bit more generous. In biology, people often need a few more, so you can go up to six. Uh, yeah, I work a little bit myself just below that. Uh, but I think it fosters a, you know, a lot of cross connections. You really have to rely on other people, learn on them, same way you did at Bell Labs, form a little bit more of a community. Um, I think they're trying to structure it a little bit like Bell Labs where, you know, Bell Labs is saying was you don't grow old gracefully at Bell Labs. You know, you would usually find out a place where you could sort of be maybe a few years, 10 years, get a good start, and then go on. I think they want to do something similar to Genelia. Um, and so I, I think it has a, a lot of attributes, maybe not quite to the extreme. I wouldn't, I mean, the on steroids, I and mean, Bell Labs was pretty on steroids <laughs> by itself. <laughs> 
and I wouldn't say it's quite to that level. It's uh, the problem, the nature of the problems are a little bit different too. In biology, some of these things just require just a ton of patience. It has two modalities of operating. You know, there are people just have an idea and hunker down, uh, but a lot can be sort of teamwork. As for example, the fly is very much teamwork. The uh, the uh, correlative, that's just sort of very tight local collaborations between just a, you know, a few people, you know, but maybe harnessing the rest of the team. But they do go out of the way to really <clears throat> allow you just focus on the work. You know, they have dry cleaners if you don't want to wash your own clothes. They, you know, they make a monastic-like environment where you can just literally live there do your stuff. You don't write grant proposals or anything like that. You just focus, get things done, and try to make a difference somehow after a certain time period. So I think it has a lot of attributes. They also try to work in a mode where they work on ideas which might not be easily attacked or done, let's say, at another institution. Uh, for example, I mean, this little thing, Getting, spending five years to make a reliable machine isn't exactly the subject of a science paper. But, you know, but here it's tolerated. Yeah. Developing special fluorescent probes, I, and there are examples where that's happened nicely in universities too, Roger Chen obviously. Uh, but I think they're a little bit more appreciated. There's a little bit of a tool, tool maker's bias to it. And maybe that came through here. Um, but also, you know, part of the nice things of Bell Labs was certainly like if there's a larger project, a win going, you know, you could get, you know, the, the theorists excited at one end, the material scientists going, you know, some measurements going on here, and then pretty soon you characterize the daylights out of, you know, a particular topic. And so I think that has elements of that. I don't think it's ever on the scale that Bell Labs was, but I think it's, it's good that it exists. And I hope maybe some other institutions that are forming based on a lot of foundation money will, you know, will sort of take some at attribute of that. Okay. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>